This is The GTN Show, welcome. And it is just me this week, Mark's on holiday again. But don't worry, we're still gonna have an action-packed show. We've got plenty of race news, we've got GTN Tribe, we've got Hot or Not. And we're also gonna be looking into the fittest cities. Well, before we get onto the main part of the show, I just want to show off slightly, mainly because I am quite proud of this. I did my first ever swim run race. Now, Mark's not here, so I can actually talk about it a little bit more because he is an expert in swim run. I'm not, it was my first ever race. It was a sea swim, or five sea swims, and six runs all along the coastal path. So ridiculously hilly running, very cold swimming, and the combination just kept shocking my body from one to the other. And it was much harder than I anticipated. I must admit, I kind of went in there going, yeah, just a bit of running and a bit of swimming. And I think it's made me realize that the bike part of a triathlon is in some ways a bit of a mental break because I did find it genuinely really tough. I did the longer event and was seriously tempted at halfway point to call it a day there, but I thought, no, I need to challenge myself and do the full distance. And I was pushed right until the end, but I did come away with this little trophy. So um, yeah, I was quite proud of myself. More to the point that I just actually finished it. And big respect to anyone who does swim run and also to Mark, but I won't tell him that one. Okay, it's time to look at the fittest city. So the American College of Sports Medicine has looked at the American Fitness Index and they took the 100 largest cities in the USA and have ranked them according to their fitness. Well, to work out this ranking, they used a combination of health behaviors, outcomes, and community infrastructure. And there's quite a few factors, so I'm just gonna have a look at this list here, including things in their index indicators were the amount of exercise that people have done in the last 30 days, um, whether they consumed two fruits a day or more, the percentage of people consuming three vegetables a day or more, getting seven or more hours sleep, then they had health outcomes such as the percent with obesity, percent with asthma or high blood pressure, stroke, I mean there's lots more under that list. So a lot of factors were taken into consideration. But one of the reasons it was so important, it's thought that cities with strong communities of fitness also have individuals with strong personal fitness. And there's a quote here from the Surgeon General, Jerome M. Adams, who says, the health and economy of communities are often strongly correlated. Healthier communities tend to be economically more prosperous and vice versa. Improved community conditions for health, such as clean and safe neighborhoods, access to health food options and opportunities, exercise and physical activity can help positively influence health behaviors and lead to a more productive workforce. So, I mean, that just emphasizes the importance of a study like this and the fact the way they're using it is quite interesting because they're trying to get each city to almost be competitive against each other. So they've made this ranking. You can see the map of the United States and where the cities rank on that, which is quite interesting to look at. But the best bit about this fitness index ranking, it's not purely the numbers on the map and where the city ranks, they're looking at how they can then help those cities. So they're giving formal guidance to the community leaders, helping them to basically improve the physical activity with strategies and policies in that area. And it's something that I'm not aware of in the UK, but I know that the North and Scotland does sometimes get labeled as being less healthy than the South. And it got me thinking, why is this? Well, it was actually Ironman who noticed the correlation between large sporting events and the top ranked cities. For example, inside the top 10, six of those cities host Ironman events. So 21 cities hosted a total of 30 34 Ironman events, including full Ironman, half Ironman, the marathons, and half marathons run by them. Well, it's not just the sporting events that affect things, and it got me thinking about the facilities. Now, in the UK, we do sometimes get a little frustrated at the lack of swimming pools that we have nearby. But since 2012, the legacy from the London Olympics, it has improved and there are more facilities around. Now, I'm sure as triathletes, you're very much aware of what your local area has on offer, and especially when it comes to swimming pools. So that brings me on to asking you guys the question in this week's GTN poll. Well, for this week's poll, we want to know how far you live from your nearest swimming pool. Is it just naught to one miles away? Is it one to two miles away? Do you have to travel between two and four miles to your local pool? Or do you have to travel four miles or more? Let us know by clicking on the poll up here. And that brings us on to the results from last week's poll, when we asked you if you'd ever checked the WADA band list. And well, I don't really know what I was expecting, but only 20% of you have checked the band list before, and a massive 80% have never looked. So I'd say it's worth going to check that out. 
Right, it's now time for an exciting announcement. It is the winners of the Park Tool giveaway. So we were giving away a Torque driver a couple of weeks ago, and 10 lucky winners they are. First up, Larissa Tasnardi Gomez, Phil Wakefield, Yoris Plessers, Eleni Alves, Shane Porteous, Richard Lynn, Richard Meladay, Michael Rode, Jamie Reeve, and Jeff Allardyce. Well, you guys will be receiving one of those talk drivers very soon. It's now time for Hot or Not. And first up, it is a legacy triathlon in the USA held at Long Beach. That's gonna start next year. Now, the Olympics have been awarded to LA for 2028. And this event is basically gonna be on the course that they plan to use for the Olympics. It's starting in 2019, nine years out from the game. So it's gonna be a chance for age groupers to actually race on the course. It's gonna be a sprint distance event and it's just basically already getting the city ready for triathlon and embracing the fact that the Olympics is coming back to LA. And to be honest, I mean, it's a new event, it's increasing the participation for triathlon, it's putting triathlon on the map. So from me, it's a big fat hot. Well, we have another new pro who's changed brands and is now riding a new bike. It's Heather Wertel who's going to be riding the Parley. Not just her, but her husband, Trevor, as well. Now, Heather last year was on the Cervelo. We saw her riding the P5X, but she's just made a change a few weeks ago, so it's going to be exciting to see how she gets on with this new bike. And it's always exciting to see brands that aren't quite so popular in triathlon coming to the scene. So for me, it's a hot. European tech company Be Cool have just teamed up with Human Race, the event organizers for the Royal Windsor Triathlon that's coming up in June. And they've used the GPX data to upload to their indoor simulator. So athletes can now basically do a course recce from the comfort of their home, giving them that bit of an advantage. So anything that's gonna help athletes on race day has got to be hot. The New York Triathlon, which has been going since 2009, has just announced a course change for the run. It used to go through the north side, through some woods and some hilly sections, but apparently they're now avoiding those hills and they're taking the runners closer to midtown Manhattan for more of those sites and more of an atmosphere. But also they're hoping that making the course flatter will attract more athletes to come and have a go. Well, Cameron Dye is a winner of this race twice in a row and he's actually a split opinions. He's been quoted as saying that the running hills could get a little Little bit lonely but then he's also worried that a flatter course might eliminate part of what he sees as his competitive advantage. Now I must say that it's quite nice to have courses that have different features and they're not just all about going fast on, on flat courses so for me it's actually going to get a knot. Well there's a new release from Control Tech, the Time Zone Aero Bar designed for triathlon and time trialing and it's got the ability to change the settings and the angles. You can change the height by different spaces, a 20, a 40 and a 60 mil spacer option. You've also got the option of making it into a more aggressive position for time trials or less aggressive for more endurance triathlon type events. Basically it's got lots of adaptations so you can make it perfectly to suit whatever you're doing, whatever your next race might be. So I'd say it's gonna be a hot. Well, our final item is a new feature film made by On that's following Tim Don and his miraculous recovery after his horrific accident in Kona last year. Now, you've probably heard on the show, we have mentioned and followed quite a bit of Tim Don's progress from wearing that horrendous halo through to running the Boston Marathon. And he's still on his recovery, but this film has just been announced. And I'd suggest once you've finished watching the show, obviously, it is definitely worth a watch. It's a big fat hot. It's time for race news and we're going to start with the ITU Paratriathlon World Cup that was held at Eton Dorney in the UK over the weekend. Now there were 12 medal races, so a few too many for us to go into the detail unfortunately, but there was a serious domination by Team GB at this event. They won 9 of the 12 races, including the PTWC category, which basically saw a repeat at the top of the podium from the Commonwealth Games results. So on the men's side it was Joe Townsend who took the win again. Then on the women's side, it was a first, second and third for Great Britain and it was led by Jay Jones who doubled up with that gold after the Commonwealth. Well, Andy Lewis had a strong performance to take the win in the PTS2 by over two minutes, but in the PTS5, it wasn't quite the result that Great Britain were hoping for. George Peasgood finished second to Martin Schultz of Germany who took the win. And then another very competitive race with the PTVI, which was won by Dave Ellis. Now he was actually partnered, or guided I should say, by Mark Buckingham. 
Next up, we have Ironman Brazil in Florianopolis, and it was a strong dominating performance by Jesper Svensson. He led just a few seconds out from the swim. He increased that lead quite dramatically on the bike. But then on the run, it did look like he might have a bit of competition coming from Igor Amorelli as he started to close that gap at about 23K to just four minutes. But Svensson went on to open the gap up again, winning by over six minutes in total. It was Igor Amorelli who was second for Brazil in his home country followed by his teammate and third, Thiago Vinhal. Well, on the women's side, it was an incredibly fast start to the day in the swim with Hayley Chura coming out almost six minutes ahead of the eventual winner, but she did drop off and finished fourth. But it was Kirsty Jan who overtook Chura on the bike ride and got the fastest bike split of the day, the second fastest run of the day, to take the win by over eight and a half minutes ahead of Seria Pampiano, who actually ran a sub three hour marathon to take second for Brazil. And she was joined on the podium by fellow countrywoman Bruna Mahan in third. Well, next up is the tough and iconic course that is Ironman Lanzarote. And it was Alessandro de Gasperi who had a strong race. He was just 13 seconds off the leaders when it came to the swim. And then by 20K on the bike, he had taken the lead to get the fastest bike split of the day, came into T2 with a comfortable margin. He maintained that to win by over six minutes ahead of Ivan Rava, who was second. And then it was the Frenchman Cyril Vieno who was third. Well, on the women's side, it was a strong start to the day for Michelle Vesterby. With her strong swim and bike, she was in the lead until Lucy Gossage, who posted the fastest bike split of the day, overtook her and had the lead of over four minutes going into T2. And she maintained that lead quite comfortably to take the overall win. It was Michelle Vesterby who finished second, and then Great Britain's Nikki Bartlett was third. Next, we have Ironman 70.3 Poulton, and it was Giulio Molinari who looked like he had it all under control. He was leading the race for all of it until 10K into the run. And then it was an incredibly strong performance on the bike and the run by Michael Weiss. He got the fastest bike split and the fastest run split to take the overall win. It was Rudy Wald who moved up into second, and then Giulio Molinari ended up third. Well, on the women's side, it was Helen Fredrickson who had a strong start to the day, but Laura Phillip, 20K into the bike, took the lead. And then she opened that up with the fastest run of the day, a 118 half marathon. To take the win, it was Hella Fredrickson who was second, and then Anya Boronek who was third. On to Challenge Salut, a 70.3 distance. And it was Pablo de Pina Gonzalez who had a strong start to the day, but that didn't last for very long because Cameron Worth had an absolutely storming bike. He went under two hours, which gave him a significant margin going into the run, enough that he managed to hold on and take the win ahead of Pablo de Pina Gonzalez, who was second. And then it was George Goodwin of Great Britain, who was third. On the women's side, it was Judith Caracan Vaquera, who was just off the pace with the swim, but thanks to the fastest bike split of the day, followed by the fastest run of the day, took the overall win ahead of Great Britain's Laura Siddle, who finished second, and then it was Margie Santa Maria who came in in third. And now on to Exterra, and it's Exterra Italy in the beautiful Lake Garda, and the battle was on between the two Frenchmen, the Arthurs, Arthur Serrieres and Arthur Forrester. Now, two weeks ago in Greece, it was Forrester who came out on top, but I think that fueled the fire for Serrieres because it came down to a run a battle between these two, and it was Serrieres who had the stronger run to take the overall win. It was Arthur Forrester who came second for France. And then in third, it was Ugazo Mocello. Well, in the women's race, it was an incredibly strong swimming performance by Nicole Walters, but she was overtaken on the bike by Karina Vals. But then there was changes again when it came to the run. It was Helena Kereskova Ebenova who had the fastest run of the day to take the overall win ahead of Karina Vals, finished second, and then Nicole Walters held on for third. It is now time for the caption competition. And last week we had this picture from a rather chilly ITU World Cup in Astana, Kazakhstan. And we had some great caption suggestions. The runner up, which is my choice from Joseph S. Hayden. I shouldn't have burned all my matches. I like that one. But my favourite this week comes in from Abby Senior. Now, just before I read out the caption, I need to explain this is with reference to a video that we made on the nine things you shouldn't do in a triathlon, in particular referencing a clip of me wearing my wetsuit 
whilst on a tri bike. You might have to check that one out. But the caption is, should have ignored GTN's advice and kept my wetsuit on for the bike and the run. Well, well done, Abby. You'll be getting one of these caps, so just get in touch, give us your details, and we'll be sending that to you. Well, this week, we have this picture. Now, I did think Mark's away. I could choose another you know, cheeky photo of Mark, but I kind of don't want to get, you know, wind him up the wrong way. So I thought I will actually put myself on the line here for you guys to suggest your captions. Now, this is from the Hokey Cokey Mad Hatter event that I did on the weekend, the swim run that I was talking about. Now, bear in mind, I have just finished and I've been racing for three hours and 17 minutes at this moment, so I'm very tired. I am trying to do a high five in that photo, believe it or not, but, you know, it is at the end of a race. And I think it looks a little bit more like I'm going country dancing. But let me know your caption suggestions in the comments section below. It's now time for the GTN Tribe, and we have a GTN Tribe first because we are featuring a military triathlon team. This is a triathlon team of the 1st Battalion, the Duke of Lancaster's Regiment. Now, they are currently deployed to Cyprus, so we're going to go to Cyprus on our map, and they say that they use triathlon to promote fitness across all the ranks, and they challenge their soldiers in new ways. Currently in Cyprus, which is great for triathlon training, they've got a growing triathlon community, and apparently 10 of their soldiers are British cycling qualified ride leaders, so they get to introduce cycling and triathlon to their soldiers. So, pretty nice deployment by the looks of it. You can see some of their team kits certainly stands out. You wouldn't, you definitely know which regiment they're from with those Lanx tops. Well, we love hearing from all the clubs wherever you are in the world. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, yeah, I want to see my club on the GTN show, well, make sure you send in any pictures, any videos, and any information you have using the hashtag GTN Tribe. Well, that's it for this week's GTN show. But coming up this weekend, there is the exciting Challenge Championship in San Marin. And we as GTN are going to be out there chatting to the pros and hopefully catching up with as many of you guys. So do come and say hi if you spot us. And if you haven't yet done so, hit the globe to subscribe. And if you're not sure whether to wear triathlon shoes or cycling shoes in your next race, well, you can watch that video here where Mark did a comparison. And if you're looking to do a beach exit and nail that, in your next race, that's just here.